Welcome to episode 521 of the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. I'm Ashley Scott Myers, screenwriter and blogger over at sellingyourscreenplay.com. Today I am interviewing William Eubank, who is an indie filmmaker with a lot of passion for making movies. One of his early projects was actually a contained sci-fi story set in a spaceship, and he personally built the spaceship set in his parents' backyard. So we talk about, about that a little bit, and ultimately how those early films of his led to his latest film, Land of Bad starring Liam Hemsworth and Russell Crowe. This is the film this is a film he directed and co-wrote and we dig into this latest project and really talk about how that all came together for him as well. So stay tuned for that interview. SYS's six figure screenplay contest is open for submissions. Just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. Our regular deadline is May 31st so if your script is ready definitely submit now to save money. We're looking for low budget shorts and features. I'm defining low budget as less than six figures. In other words, less than 1 million US dollars. We've got lots of industry judges reading scripts in the later rounds. We're giving away thousands in cash and prizes. We have a short film script category as well, 30 pages or less. So if you have a low budget short script, by all means, submit that one. I've got a number of industry judges who are specifically looking for short scripts. So hopefully we can find a home for some of these short scripts as well. If you want to submit or learn more about the contest, just go to www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. Also, again, this year we are running an in-person film festival in tandem with our screenplay contest. It is like our screenplay contest. It is a film festival for low budget films produced for less than 1 million US dollars. We have featured and shorts category. The festival is going to take place here in Los Angeles, California from October 4th to October 6th. So if you have a film and you it's low budget, please do take a look at our landing page and just see if you think this might be a good fit for your film. We have um, we have a page on our website, sellingyourscreenplay.com slash festival, but that will just direct you over to our film freeway page where we're actually taking the film submissions. They have a more robust submission platform for accepting submissions. So all the film festival submissions actually go through Film Freeway. We also will take screenplay submissions through Film Freeway as well. So if you're on Film Freeway and you have a script and want to submit there as well, that's totally fine. Um, but we do take um, the screenplay contest entries on sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest. And we also take them through Coverfly. Coverfly is another um, one of these aggregation sites um, that has a lot of screenwriters in it. So we get a lot of submissions from them as well. So if you're on Coverfly, if you're on Film Freeway, um, you know, no problem at all. Just submit through those services and um, it'll all end up back at Selling Your Screenplay. But of course, you can go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash contest if you'd like to submit directly to us. If you find this episode valuable, please help me out by giving me a review in iTunes or leaving a comment on YouTube or retweeting the podcast on Twitter or liking or sharing it on Facebook. These social media shares really do help spread word about the podcast, so they're very much appreciated. Any websites or links that I mentioned in the podcast can be found on my blog in the show notes. I also publish a transcript with every episode in case you'd rather read the show or look at something later on. You can find all the podcast show notes at www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash podcast, and then just look for episode number 521. If you want my free guide, how to sell a screenplay in five weeks, you can pick that up by going to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. It's completely free. You just put in your email address and I'll send you a new lesson once per week for five weeks along with a bunch of bonus lessons. I teach the whole process of how to sell your screenplay in that guide. I'll teach you how to write a professional log line and query letter and how to find agents, managers, and producers who are looking for material. Really is everything you need to know to sell your screenplay. Just go to sellingyourscreenplay.com slash guide. So now just a couple of quick words about what I'm working on. I've been talking about this for the last couple of months, um, but I'm still working on this big server migration project and selling your screenplay.com is obviously a part of that, but I have a number of other websites too that I run and those are on the server. So it's just taken a lot longer than I had originally planned, but the good news is I am almost done um, hopefully here um, in the next week or two. So by mid April, let's say um, I should be be done with that and um, hopefully can get back to um, some screenwriting and f filmmaking real soon. So I just want to take a minute today and talk about AI. There's been a lot about AI in the news and um, how it's going to affect the entertainment business and then ultimately how it's going to affect writers specifically. 
So the first thing I want to say about AI um, is obviously I'm not an expert. Um, I definitely have experience in the entertainment business, definitely have experience with screenwriting, but I'm definitely not an expert at AI. So if there's anybody who listens to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast who works in the AI field or really has some expertise in this, please just reach out to me. I'd love to um, have you on the podcast and, and kind of hear your thoughts um, from really the AI Per perspective. But I'll give you my perspective. And there's definitely two parts to this that I see. The first piece of the AI is what we're hearing about. Um, you know, and a lot of it sounds like the strike, the writer strike, and the actor strike was a big piece of this was, you know, writers and actors are concerned that AI will be able to just churn out um, an entire screenplay. Um, and that's, you know, obviously that would take jobs away from us, but I'm a little skeptical of that. Is that whether that's actually going to happen anytime soon? Um, it just feels like we're a long ways for that. Um, I, I, I listened to this um, this author on TikTok, Jason Pargan, and he actually wrote um, the book for John Dies at the End. Um, and he's written a number of novels. He's a writer. Yeah, he's a really funny guy. I think he's almost more of a comedian than, than anything else, but a very funny guy. And he just posts interesting TikToks. And he had one on AI. And he made the point, um, which I totally agree with, is that... Um, you know, for AI, when you go to AI and say, recommend a pizza, you know, place, the, give me the best pizza place in New York City, um, it's hard to imagine that any machine or any any creature or any any device or anything could really successfully recommend pizza when they themselves have never actually experienced or tasted pizza. And I think there's a real valid point in that you know, the self-driving, we've been hearing about self-driving cars now for probably 10 years. Oh, we're almost there. We're almost there to self-driving. And when you dig into it, they pretty much have self-driving on the freeways. The the sort of the, the broad strokes of it um, work well in probably, and they're probably like 90% there. It's that last 10% that's really tough. Um, I heard a little video of some guy that was testing out the AI and he said, you know, on the freeway, it can change lanes. It can get off the freeway. It can avoid traffic, can avoid accidents, avoid traffic. Traffic. So on the freeway where there's a, a very finite number of choices, it does really well. But then this vehicle got off the road and um, it went down like a runway street and there was like parking from like, you know, 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. And so it was getting stuck behind these parked cars. I couldn't figure that. So, you know, those are the sorts of, of real intricate details um, that I think come into play when you start talking about AI and what it can really do. Um, there's there's nuance, um, there's life experience, and there's taste. I mean, it's it's not just, you know, when we go to see a Quentin Tarantino, Tarantino movie, his sort of taste and point of view is very distinct, and that's kind of why we're there. Um, so again, I just, I'm skeptical that AI is gonna really master that um, soon. I mean, um, it just, it feels like it's a long ways from creating a full-blown screenplay of a story that a human would actually want to go and see. And I've actually got in there and tested this. I've tried to do a couple scenes, and I've mentioned this on the podcast before. Um, you know, maybe for my next script, I might actually use it to help with the vomit draft. Just give it some scenes to write, pull them out, and then rewrite them. Um, my my mother, um, who, uh, who my mother actually runs a garden blog, which is one of the one of the other sites that's on my server in this server migration. Um, she does a garden blog, and she's been, you know, she's real progressive on some of these technology things and likes to try things out. And so she's been using it for her garden blog and I'm um, just going into AI and sort of getting it again to do sort of a rough draft. But, you know, she, she tells me about the mistakes it makes and it's, you know, it's sort of laughable at this stage. Um, some of just the, the huge mistakes it makes, but it, it does seem to give her sort of a first draft and it kind of gets her over that hump. So again, it's a tool. Um, but is that really going to just out of whole cloth, even if you feed it a story idea, is that really going to be able to come back to you with a fully fleshed out screenplay that's fun and enjoyable and is a page turner? Um, I'm skeptical. Again, I just think we have a ways to go before that act actually happens. Eventually, sure. I mean, I, I'm you know very bullish on technology. Um, I love technology, and and I do think that there's almost no limits to what we can achieve with technology. But I'm not sure that there will do this in my lifetime, frankly. Um, I mean, to write this fully fleshed out screenplay, let's just say you feed it an idea or a logline and then it just pumps out a screenplay for you. I mean, you're going to need 
a, a fully sentient computer. Like it's just, it's not just a, you know, it's a mechanical process um, that you can just put something in and, and it can, you know, the ones and the zeros and it spits back this piece of art. Um, it, it's just not a mechanical process that feels all that simple. Now, with that said, and this is the piece that I think will affect writers and I mean, I, I take a step back. I do think actors have a big problem. I think the service that they provide to the entertainment industry, I think that that can be digitized and probably will be digitized in the next, you know, five, 10 years. Um, I think famous people, um, you know, they have a brand and so they will be able to license their image and likeness out just as, you know, famous athletes and famous celebrities do now. So I think once you can achieve a certain amount of fame, I think actors, you know, will be fine. But um, I, I don't know, like extras, some of these smaller roles that don't require a great deal of acting ability, you know, a waitress in the background. I mean, I just sort of feel like a lot of those types of roles, they will ultimately be replaced by AI. Um, and again, this is not me saying I want that or you know I don't wish you know ill on any of my actor friends um, but I definitely do see it as an issue that's going to hit them a lot sooner than it hits the 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 screenwriters and so you know thinking about that that's where I think the screenwriters will or, or, or filmmakers will be impacted by AI. Some of the new stuff that I've seen coming out with video, um, I, this was maybe a month ago now, but um, one of the AI companies released some sort of a thing where you could put in a sentence and it, it would actually pump out, you know, a 90 second or 60 second or 30 second video, um, you know, basically using your description. And um, they, the videos weren't bad. The, the Again, they were sort of wide shots. So you're not getting that sort of real detail on people's face and expressions and emotions, um, but you're getting some sort of broad, broad shots, the wide shots, sort of the establishing shots. Um, and I've heard from other filmmakers and I've seen this, I've read about this where, you know, things like a teaser trailer, creating a trailer before you shoot your movie, creating a little promo video before you do your Kickstarter. That's where I think these AI tools in the very near term, like in the next year or two will be quite helpful. Um, you know, we'll be able to just very cheaply and easily, you know, get some pretty high quality video. Maybe it won't pass muster, you know, compared to a studio movie or something like that. Um, but I bet we'll be able to get sort of some rough draft type um, video here in just the next year or two by just typing in a sentence and it'll put that out. So ultimately then, then the goal clearly is gonna be just feeding your entire screenplay into that AI and it's just gonna pump out the polished film. Um, and that's something that I think the, that sort of a tool, um, I do think is probably closer, um, a lot closer than, than what people are talking about where a, a sentient computer can actually create art, you know, that, that humans are actually interested in looking at. Um, that's, that's a, 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 to me, in my mind, in my view, that's a much bigger step than creating a mechanical tool that's just, frankly, just a little bit better than what we already have. Um, we're not that far, far enough away. And again, it's, it's a more, it's a more mechanical process, just feeding in a couple of sentences and it outputting a video to illustrate what you fed into it. Um, it's not nearly as much as the nuance and the taste and that sort of stuff that comes into play. Um, so that's sort of where I see it going. And, and as a filmmaker myself, obviously I'm a screenwriter, but I'm also a filmmaker. Um, that's where I'm excited and, and frankly, kind of keeping my eye on it. I want to be one of the first people. Once this sort of gets going, um, I'd love to play with those tools and to start to figure out how can I, as just a indie filmmaker, um, you know, as from a producer standpoint, um, it'll make, you know, you, you, if it's going to be AI generating all this stuff, you don't need to even really worry about budget of your film. You can have as many actors, you can have car crashes, you can have helicopters, you know, crashing into the White House, whatever you want. Um, if it's going to do it digitally, it's not going to, it's not going to make any difference um, on the budget. And that's, that's exciting. And I think that's where I think filmmakers could really, um, would, could, could really benefit. And I think as a screenwriter, I think that's something to start to think about yourself. Um, you know, there's always going to be a need for a good screenplay, at least, you know, in, in my lifetime, I would think, as I said, I, I, I don't think it's the computers are going to be churning out high quality screenplays anytime soon. Um, but some of this other stuff um, should get us thinking a little bit. OK, what are we going to do when you can just feed in a screenplay and the entire movie is output, um, a polished, you know, studio level movie is output. Um, 
what what is that going to like? What is that going to do the entertainment industry? Well, what it's going to do is it's going to put a lot of the power on the people that can write these high quality screenplays, on the people that know how to write a screenplay and ultimately utilize these tools. But if you can write a good screenplay and utilize these tools, I guess if you don't want to be a producer or director, you could just write the good screenplay and then give it to someone that's maybe more technical and understands how to use these AI tools. Um, but I sort of like that stuff. I like directing. I like sort of be the the master of my own domain. Um, so for me, this is very very exciting. And as I said, I'm looking for opportunities. Now, the, the test that I saw a couple weeks ago was like a beta test. I didn't don't know anybody or how to get in. So I wasn't able to get in there and start to use that. Um, but I would definitely say keep an eye on this stuff. Um, and, you know, certainly for short films or or whatever, you know, people can start to pump some of this stuff out and we can kind of just see the quality of it. And again, this is not something that's going to happen tomorrow. I, I'm saying this is probably like a five or 10 year period before really something like this is is to the point where it's commercial available. You can just feed in a screenplay. Um, it could be 20 years. I mean, it could be a while, but I do think that's on the horizon um, as opposed to a fully sentient computer that can just um, churn out an entire um, work of art. Um, you know, that's that seems to me that that final 10% of, of going from um, sort of this mechanical process of taking a screenplay and turning it into a movie. Um, that's pretty straightforward in a lot of ways. And um, again, these people, the people that use these tools, the directors, the producers, um, the maybe there'll be a cinematographer or a lighting guy or something, you know, there'll be different positions and different people that that still it'll probably be some collaboration. And there'll be people that are experts at the lighting, and they'll know how to tweak these tools, they'll know how to what to write in the prompts. Um, and that stuff is all going to be very, very valuable. But again, I still think at the core of all of this stuff is going to be good storytelling. The people that know how to write good screenplays, the people that know how to write good stories, um, compelling stories, stories that get people excited, people that stories that get people motivated to come and watch them. I think that's where um, I think that's where a lot of the magic is going to happen. And I think that's where, where this is headed in the in the near term. So that's some of my thoughts on AI. Again, if you work in the space or, or have some expertise in the space, um, by all means, reach out to me, info at sellingyourscreenplay.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts on it and, and perhaps do a podcast episode with you. So anyways, those are some of the things I have been working on. Now let's get into the main segment. Today, I am interviewing filmmaker William Eubank. Here is the interview. Welcome, William, to the Selling Your Screenplay podcast. Really appreciate you coming on the show with me today. Hey, thank you so much for having me. This is great. So to start out, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your background. Where'd you grow up and how did you get interested in the entertainment business? Grew up kind of just north of Santa Barbara in this uh, sort of ranching community um, called like San Ynez, or there's like a Danish community up there called Solvang. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were, yeah, we were out on a ranch with a bunch of horses. And uh, yeah, I just knew I was love my mom was like a children's book author illustrator and i uh i just loved art and i i either wanted to like go into the navy which my grandfather had gone to annapolis so i was like i either wanted to like try to go fly jets or i wanted to make movies and uh in the end i was really bad at math like i was barely surviving all my like calculus classes and everything mm -hmm. and i knew in order to be a pilot like you had to you had to like you know score you had to be at the top of your class at annapolis and that means you're an engineer so i knew that i was i was gonna have a hard time going that way and i went to i think it was the first year they had it, or at least the first year they had it here in in los angeles i went to the new york film academy and um back then it was kind of this amazing program where you shot on the universal back lot we shot 16 millimeter we caught on old steam Becks. And that's when I knew, like, I just loved, uh, I loved filmmaking. And that's what I was going to do. So mm -hmm. from there on out, um, I was like, okay, I got to get into a film school and do all that. And unfortunately, film school didn't really work out. I spent two years at UCLA because uh, you had to do the UCLA undergrad program first. To, and then you could apply to the, um, or the general ed, you had to finish your general ed, then you could apply to have your major B film. Gotcha. And um, unfortunately did not make it in. I like missed my interview. And the crazy thing is this, I used to give this girl a ride to uh, Santa Barbara back up where I lived every weekend. And she was always like, I don't know what I'm going to do. And I was always telling her, well, I'm going to the film school. 
And then she called me. She's like, Will, because I left UCLA after I didn't get in. She calls me. She's like, Will, where are you? I thought you were going to the film school. I'm like, no, nah, I didn't get in. She's like, oh, well, you inspired me to apply and I got in. I'm like, oh, my <laughs> God, what the heck? <laughs> so, so how did that dovetail in with the what you said, the New York Film Academy? You, oh, so, you sorry, went... New York Film Academy. Sorry, that was like a summer camp. I should have said that. OK. Yeah, it was just like a two week or maybe it was like a month program. Okay. Uh, it was a summer camp. So I did that when I was like, I think I had just turned 16 years old. Gotcha. Um, And then, yeah. So obviously school was real school was a lot later. So yeah, New gotcha. York Film Academy was like a dip your toe in the water program. For and me. so then, so then, so you leave UCLA and where did you end up going? From there, I went to Brooks Institute of Photography. I started learning photography up basically in Santa Barbara. And then I got a job, um, an internship at Panavision. And that's when I really started to lean into to that. I ended up actually dropping out of Brooks Institute of Photography because they, they wouldn't take my general ed from UCLA. It was like crazy. I was like, I already did all my general ed. I <laughs> can't do it again. And so I was like, all right, screw it. I'm just going to start working. Panavision gave me a job. And then I really was very, very fortunate because I basically started – working at Panavision just at the birth of like big films using digital. And it was right on the time where everyone was like, is it all going to go digital? Are people going to go digital? And so most of the technicians at Panavision stayed film and nobody really wanted to learn all the video cameras. So I was like, I guess I'll just do this because nobody's mm -hmm. doing it. And then that did not realize how strong of a sort of knowledge that would or it just was a huge foot in the door because suddenly Panavision was sending me on collateral and they were sending me on um, Superman, like anywhere something digital was being shot. I ended up working on those sets. And uh, that really kind of was another form of film school, I guess you could say. Yeah. I noticed on IMDb, you have a ton of cinematography credits, really yeah. some of which are even before you're writing and directing credits. Yeah. Um, so is this how you're sort of getting into the business? You're exactly. actually starting to get yeah. some gigs. Yeah. As a so student. I started Panavision. They were like, I still consider Panavision my film school. They would let me take the cameras on the weekends. Oh. Uh, they They were always hooking me up with gear for free. And back then, like, I mean, I don't even know. I'm sure you can't do this anymore. But yeah, they, they let me. David Dotson and Panavision and Bob Harvey, those guys, they probably let millions of dollars go out the door for me to shoot with. And mm -hmm. at one point, I think David Dotson let me keep an F900, like a big digital cinema camera, like <laughs> under my, I like kept it in my cupboard at home for like months uh, cause I was trying to shoot this project on the weekends and, you know, it was just, mm -hmm. it was, I owe so much to all Panavision for my career. So, mm -hmm. so at this point you're doing, you're starting to do, you're working at Panavision, you're starting to do some of these weekend projects at this point. Did you know you wanted to write and direct and are you oh, starting yeah. to write oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. stuff? No, no, that's always the goal. Okay. Um, this was just my way in, you know, learning, learning the shots, learning the, the language of, of filmmaking through mm -hmm. the lens, you know? Um, and how do you I, let, how do you let people know in a appropriate way that today I'm just the PA here, you know, running around doing any odd job, but ultimately I want to be a writer director. How do you just make those connections and not be too pushy about it and not be, no, you just never tell anyone. Like I never told anyone, you know, okay. no, nobody wants to hear that. You know, mm -hmm. not only that, like when I'm young, when I was younger, I was so enthusiastic and I, I was like, you know, I was ACing a lot. I was an assistant cameraman a lot. I was changing. I had film bags. I my I had to buy my own film bag, which was three hundred dollars, which back then was so much money for me. And like, you know, mm -hmm. I'm like changing mags inside these things. And you know, you're never trying to. You never telling people like, hey, I'm going to be a director. Nobody cares. Like, you know. So I was just like, you know, you're just dreaming your own stories up. You're always writing them down. I have so many booklets of my old ideas and. Um, you know, you just, I was, I guess what I'm saying also is I was so enthusiastic to just actually be working on sets and doing that, um, that it wasn't like they were separate things. It was just, you know, you're doing this mm -hmm. job and then you're, you're directing, that's going to be your own thing. You know, you're going to do that on your own. So if you're saying, how do you do that? Or like, how are you convincing someone to let you do that? 
you have to, of course, like make your own movie, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. and then show people a finished product. Yeah. So how did you get some of those first gigs as a professional cinematography on some of these projects? Um, how did you make that transition? Well, to become a cinematographer, it was truly like, well, it's funny. That's where I met my co-writer on this movie, uh, David Frigerio. He came into Panavision and uh, they were trying to shoot something. And I said, hey, man, I, I I do a little cinematography on my own. And I would always like shoot stuff in the prep rooms there and sort of have a little reel so I could show people like how I light and stuff. And uh, I showed it to David and he was like, well, this is pretty good. I, I was like, and I can also like, you know, I get the equipment for free. So if you let me shoot it, I can kind of hook you up. And you'd be like, OK, that sounds good. <laughs> and I had so many jobs like that. I mean, I, I shot like a Tiger Woods commercial for Buick out in like Las Vegas way back in the day. And <laughs> so like, like they were like, all right, well, we'll let you take the cameras. They knew they were giving me jobs. Like mm -hmm. Panavision was really giving me the jobs because they were letting me use the equipment for free. Gotcha. Yeah, gotcha. Even so, Buick. Yeah, even Buick likes free cameras. Yeah. I mean, it, was, it wasn't really Buick. It was a production company. But yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, Some, okay. So let's talk about your first feature film, um, Love, um, starring the fantastic Gunnar Wright. I actually did a movie with Gunnar Wright as well. Um, he was in my first feature as the lead as no well. No way. Um, oh my yeah, God. Yeah. So I was like and, my best friend here in LA. And like, I did it in 2016. So he was actually talking about Love. We actually had some conversations about this film on set um, coming up. Oh so gosh. maybe just quickly, you can give us a little backstory on this um, and I'll see how it sort of jives with, with sort of stuff. But it was an impressive production that you sort of put together on your own, correct? But maybe just sort of walk through what love was, what it was about and how you made it a reality. Yeah, that's a kind of a wild story. Basically, I was, uh, you know, I was working at Panavision still. I was doing like weekend gigs and stuff. And I had, there was a competition. YouTube was brand new. And YouTube had a competition for Red Hot Chili Peppers music video. You could just send anything you wanted in. So I shot a thing and I, I didn't, I didn't like, win or anything like that but i got in the top 20 or something and i think one of the guys at panavision because panavision guys would sometimes help me and you know there were so many people that were always kind of like helping or oh yeah we'll come shoot with you or whatever one of the guys his neighbor was adam willard who was the drummer for angels and airwaves um which was tom DeLong's band after blink 182 he saw it and showed it to tom and then tom called me while i was at work and he's like will Oh my God, I love your stuff. Um, I would love for you to come work for me. And we want to make movies and stuff. And I was like, okay. And uh, he's just like, what, how much, you know, does it cost to hire you? Or like, what's your, you know, and so I just like kind of made up some number and you know, it wasn't much money, but it was like, oh, you know, it was basically a little more than I was making at Panavision. So I went to work for Tom and we started making this like idea for this movie and we tried to shoot some of it and it was a disaster. It was so bad. I mean, someday I'll have to break out this edit. It's so horrifying. And I realized like, man, it just, it's like, I didn't have enough time to like make it great. So I was like, I need to move home and I'll just start building the set so I can control the story and shoot it on my time in, you know, my parents' backyard essentially. And um, so that's what I did. And it took me, you know, I spent probably like $20,000 on Tom's credit card at Home Depot buying materials and like all these months later. And then finally, like Tom called me one day. He's like, hey, man, we got to like let you go. Like, uh, you know, we got to just put a cap on this. And I was like, well, I, I have all the sets almost built. And he's like, yeah, we, we just we got to we got to close it up. And uh, it was around Christmas time. Gunner had seen the sets and everything. I'd met him on a travel channel show. He was like one of the motorcycle guys and I was shooting it. And uh, he, he, you know, my grandma came up for Christmas and she was like, Whoa, what is this? And I was like, Oh, I was trying to make this movie. And, you know, and she's like, and oh. I think we should give a little context here for people that are listening. I mean, it was the interior of a spaceship that you created and it looked <laughs> yeah. fantastic. I mean, in, Thank the, you. In, in the backyard of your parents, you <laughs> yeah. created the interior of the spaceship. Oh my God. Yeah. It was covered in all this visqueen. It was like, I mean, the hardest part was just like rainstorms and trying to keep it dry and not warping, you know, mm -hmm. it was just a nightmare. Every time it was raining, I was basically sleeping out there trying to shove water off the top of it. 
<laughs> but anyway, so my grandma sees it. She's pretty impressed. And she said, what do you need to make this movie? And I said, I need like $10,000. And she wrote me a check for 20 grand. And uh, so it was really my grandma who like gave me the, the money to make the darn thing. And we spent most of that money on a techno crane operator uh, because Panavision gave me a free techno crane, free camera. I just had to pay the operator for the techno crane. And that's how we got that like cool, like even though we have no anti-gravity we got that mm -hmm. like you know sort of anti-gravity feel and uh it was funny that that guy had just come off of apocalypto and he was like now at my parents house and he's just sleeping in my little brother's room who was off at college at the time and it was funny because we kept him on like an eight hour day like a normal day because we he was expensive you know mm -hmm. that was where most of the money was going was paying him and so sometimes we'd let him go. We'd be like, all right, you're done. And But he wouldn't have anything to do with it. So he'd be like, no, you guys, I'll just keep helping. And Because we'd keep shooting. And we're like, no way, man, you're done. And so he would go. My parents had like a hot tub. <laughs> we'd send him to the hot tub. <laughs> he'd just sit over there. And the funny thing is there was these frogs. There was frogs because we built it near this pool area. And these freaking frogs were going on all the time. And it was like we're supposed to be in space, but there's these frogs. So the technocrate operator, he would be over in the pool and he would be yelling and we'd be like, all right, kill the frogs. He wouldn't kill them. He would just yell and clap and mm -hmm. it would make the frogs be quiet for a second so we could do a take. Um, anyway, random story, but just crazy. Gotcha. Anyway, so we made the film, finished it, sent the footage to Tom. Tom called me. He's like, dude, this is unreal. What do I need to do to get back involved? So it paid my grandma back and uh, we started like a real post-production. That was my first movie. Gotcha. And so where did you get the, the technical chops to build this set? Like did, learn, did you have learn? Some... That's what I'm saying. That's why it took so long. I didn't know. I mean, I, I was buying nail guns, not knowing what to do with them. I bought like a chop saw, not knowing what a compound miter angle was, okay. but now I know all those things, you uh -huh. know, it's like, I am, you know, sometimes like, we had a friend who who did construction and he would come over and show me this or that. And, you know, I, we would have people like sometimes like just just through family friends that we had who'd be like, wow, Will, you're building this? Like and I'd show them something I'm having trouble with and they'd show me. I remember one guy was over one time and showing me how to use like this Brad nailer. And he's like, you always want to be careful with these Brad's because, you know, they're so bendy. They could they could go through anything. And he literally holds his little block down and he goes, you got to, you know, do this. He shoots it. It skips off a nail and it goes up and it just pops right through his finger. Oh. And it, he literally nailed the piece of wood to his finger with the Brad nailer. Oh, my God. <laughs> he was like, oh, my God, this is why I got to be careful. <laughs> I was like, oh, my God, I'm never using a Brad nailer. But, uh, yeah, that movie, what a journey, man. It was my own. So then what did you do is once you had it done, it sounds like you went back to Tom, he got back involved. And then yep. what did you guys do for distribution? Did you take it to festivals? Um, yeah, we, you know, we, we took it to festivals. We, we, you know, it was funny because there was, I got a call. We submitted to Sundance, of course, didn't get in, but I got a call from Trevor Groth and he was like, Will, I just want you to know this film was like right there. It's like, I just, I only make a couple of these calls, but man, this was yeah, it was like, you were so close. I want you to please bring me anything you do in the future. Um, and so, yes, then years later, we do the signal and they let that in. And uh, it was funny because even during the, when Trevor Groth introduced the film, he's like, everyone needs to go see Love. Like, you know, I let this film in here, but maybe that film should have been the film that should have been here. <laughs> so he was so, so nice to let Signal in. But so let's talk about that transition then from Love to the Signal. Um, how did how did Love lead to the Signal? And just in terms of financing, were you still working with Tom? Just maybe give us the two minute pitch on that. Yeah, the, basically that you know that was kind of totally separate, not involved with Tom or anything. That was that was really my first. Uh, you know, Love kind of showed I could shoot and build a story. Um, but, but the signal was more a pitch where I was like trying to think of like, how can I create something contained that is also genre and that is very pitchable. So people are like, oh, we can see that it's going to be a small movie, but it has some cool, big ideas. Um, so it was just kind of a pitch that I created and I took it around and I ended up pitching it to Brian Kavanaugh Jones, who, uh, was like, Hey, all right, this sounds cool. You go write it and then show it to me. So, I mean. It's like, okay. So then, yeah, I went and wrote it. I was shooting some second unit stuff for Nick Cassavetes at the time on this weird film and uh, very interesting film out in 
North, South Dakota, no, Oklahoma. And yeah, I wrote the signal on the nights. Like I would just start writing on the nights. I was doing it with my brother and my co-writer on this, David Frigerio. And uh, yeah, we ended up finishing a script, showed it to them. They were like, wow, we love this. We'll make it. Uh, but we probably can't find much money to do it. And I was like, that's okay. Let's just do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest is history. So Gotcha. Gotcha. And so then how did that lead to some other gigs? Like how did that propel your co career forward? Um, and ultimately we're going to talk about land of bad. I just think the signal was, we, we worked so hard on it and we, there was a lot of ideas in there. It's a, it's a very visual film, but it has some heart to it. Um, just a lot of pieces really fortunately came together. And a lot of the professionals I still work with, like my stunt coordinator, a lot of the people I still work with were on that film with me. You know, it was just so, it was such a cool movie. There was a lot of other amazing filmmakers at the time in New Mexico working on other things. Like, it was like Nash Edgerton, who's a really cool guy, ended up like stunt doubling on our movie a bunch. Um, he's made a bunch of interesting small things. That's Joel Edgerton's brother. Hmm. Um, there was just so many, I don't know, it was just like a perfect storm of, of creatives working on that. And, it, you know, it, I think... Moving forward, people were able to see we made it on a shoestring budget for almost nothing. But when you watch it, you're like, whoa, it feels big. And there's characters you care about. So it just sort of that meant something to studio execs. So when it came time to get the next job, people were like, OK, we can he can handle crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. um, it took a little while to get that next job, but 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 I finally did. So and how 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 much did having a film at Sundance help your career? And just did it help you get an a a better agent to help you get a better manager to open some doors just from the Sundance angle? I don't I don't think the Sundance angle. I don't. You know, it probably did. I mean, I'm sure it did. I'm sure people who like don't didn't watch the film or didn't whatever they just hear. Oh, it went to Sundance. So that's a good thing, you know, mm -hmm. and that probably that's like a buzzword or like a badge that was probably helpful to people who didn't know much about me or anything. But I think if people, whether the film had gone to Sundance or not, like focus features had already come on board, um, the old focus features. Actually, no, I think it was the well, I don't know where focus is now, so maybe it was old. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, they, you know. It's hard to say. I, I don't know how much that helped me like get the next movie like underwater because it was so long. I want to say there was like three or four years between mm -hmm. my next movie. Um, it just took a long time to get get the next one going. Mm -hmm. yeah, and even yeah. underwater was such a journey because I had to like test for it. They're like, okay, you have to now like it was crazy. And I want to find I don't know where it is. I've been looking for it, but I shot a test for the movie. It's kind of cool. And it was just to prove we could do a lot of the dry for wet stuff. Um, but yeah, it was like, uh, yeah, it was tough. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know what I was doing in between then? Sorry. In between the signal and underwater, I had written like two other movies and those were, were being bought up by the studios like world breaker um, and Goliath. So those movies were, were being purchased and uh but yeah, that's where I learned like you can write these things and the studio will gladly buy them so that they can shelve them and not make them, mm. but they can have the option to make them. And, that's and did you I'm... did you attach yourself as director to those yes. writing projects? Yeah. Okay. And yeah. they just got in turnaround or whatever for whatever. Yeah, exactly. And that's like, you know, when you're young, you're so excited because you're getting paid to write. Mm -hmm. But um, it stinks because you're like, wait a second. So nothing can happen with this movie unless they, you know, that the studios don't make that many, especially when you start to think about your genre in the studio, you're like, well, studio might make three sci-fi movies a year tops, maybe. So you're like, gosh, and they bought like 40, you know, mm -hmm. or whatever it was at the time. So yeah, it's just, it's tricky. It's a really tricky. You realize like you're writing these things, they're buying them. You can survive. It's awesome, but you're not really making any movies. And that's when I realized, like, yeah, sometimes it's just better to take the film that somebody else has already put a bunch of money into and they, they, like, they're already trying to make it. And that's what happened with Underwater. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Gotcha. So let's dig into your latest feature film, Land of Bad, um, starring Russell Crowe and Liam Hemsworth. Maybe to start out, you can give us a quick pitch or log line. What is this film all about? Uh, this is a movie that's like about a guy behind enemy lines. He's 
kind of a rookie operator gets into a crazy um, hostage rescue situation and loses all contact with everybody. And the only person he's got is a drone in the sky, uh, basically watching over him. And he's got, you know, a couple of hellfire missiles and that's it, <laughs> you know, so mm -hmm. it's about trying to get this guy back to safety. And where did this idea come from? What was the genesis of this story? We were writing this while we were making the signal on the weekends in a satellite coffee because there were so many weird scenes in the signal. We were I was afraid I was never going to work again because I was like, the signal is such a quirky, crazy film. I was like, man, it's just there. Nobody's going to hire me to do another film. So I need to be ready with a more sort of mainstream ish feeling film at the time. And um, David had had this idea for, you know, he learned about joint tactical air controllers and so we started at the time we called it JTAC and it was just kind of a way to actually clear our heads a little of all the craziness while shooting and everything that was going on. We would just walk to this little coffee shop and sit there all day and, you know, think of what could be happening to this guy, you know, mm -hmm. um, caught behind enemy lines. And then, you know, that idea evolved and changed over the years forever. So we'd meet JTACs, we'd meet drone guys. And of course, the idea really evolved from that first draft. Mm -hmm. But yeah, we wrote this thing like 15 years ago. Gotcha. So let's talk about your collaboration with David a little bit. Um, so it sounds like you guys are going to co the coffee shop sort of spitballing ideas. Um, once it came time to start writing, how did you handle that? Does he take a pass or do you guys sit in the same room? Maybe you can just describe sort of what you, how your co collaboration actually functions. This movie, he wrote a bunch of it first. And at the time I was thinking, um, you know, on, on the signal, I had wrote most of that first. Um, and so with, with this movie, uh, he kind of took the initial stab and he was working out a lot of things and we were spitballing on a lot of the ideas, but he was doing the core like writing. And then it's funny cause there was, I remember there was a moment where I was thinking like, nah, I don't know if I want to do this. And I was driving home, like we on the signal, we had no budget for anything. So every time I had to go back to Los Angeles, I had to drive. And I was driving with my friend and he was, my friend Liam, he was just like sitting in the, not Liam from this movie, different Liam. <laughs> he's sitting in the passenger seat and he's like, I was like, do you mind breaking open, you know, we called it JTAC at the time. I was like, can you read some of that? And he was reading it while we were driving. And I was like, man, this really moves. Like it. Dave's written like an incredibly fast ride. It's just like structurally, we there weren't the things that we were kind of looking for in there, but I was like, you know what? This is pretty darn cool. So then, then I took it from him and started my pass and it's not always how we work, but on this particular mm -hmm. movie, he really did most of the first pass. And then I did most of the second pass. Um, whereas normally we break it into scenes, which I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing, but We'll literally just kind of leapfrog each other and go. And how much time do you spend? Um, and this could be specific to the land of bad or just in general. How much time do you spend in that outlining stage where you're doing index cards, you're taking notes, you're writing stuff down versus in final draft, actually cranking out script pages? I, you're saying like in the initial planning phases? Yeah. Like just, I always like to get, you know, and I find some writers um, that I interview, they don't spend a lot of time in the planning stage. They just like to get into yeah. final draft. And those people generally have to spend a lot more time rewriting. There's some yep. people that are maybe a little more organized. They do a lot in the planning stage yep. and they can, they can put out a draft in like two weeks. Sure. Yeah. I honestly, like my weakest link is that organizational stage at the start because I'll have these visions of like how the details of this thing should work. Um, and I just want to write that scene that I want to see. So that's one of my greatest weaknesses. Um, but now I've, I've gotten better at like banging out at least three pages of like the core. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Um, but I still struggle with that sometimes because what ends up happening to me specifically when I get that outline going it gets so wooden that I sometimes lose my my oomph to do the work because I'm like, ah, that's, oh, oh, my God, there's a Mount Everest right there in front of me and I can't solve it. And then I don't even want to write it because I'm like so caught by this like large plot thing I see in the distance and I can't stop thinking about it. Whereas sometimes when I just start writing, 
while I'm in the zone and I get in the zone, then the good ideas just like come down like divine intervention and go into my head. And I'm like, Oh yes. Oh my God. Oh, I can't write fast enough. You know? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I tend to work better when I don't do too much outlining, but like you said, then you get to the end and you're like, Oh my God. That, all right. That's a mess. But I don't mind the rewriting part because my, especially if I'm going to direct it, there's going to be so much that has to be sorted out. Like, I almost think like the second part of writing is like, you can have your script however you want it. And then you get to like where I start storyboarding and I'm like, Oh my God, like this doesn't work at all. Like the blocking where the characters are doing, like that's when I'll start to draw the shot lists and the storyboards. And it's almost like the second writing phase. And you realize like, Oh, this isn't even going to be cinematic. Like I wrote this boring scene with these two dudes who aren't even moving or, you know, and that, that second stage of the boarding and the, and the shot listing, or the shot maps, mm -hmm. that's when I'll like kind of rewrite the script again. Yeah, gotcha. I'm curious just how it sounds like you've written a number of scripts with David. Um, how do you guys get through issues? Do you guys ever just get to a point where he thinks one thing, you think the opposite, you know, and and how do you get through those moments where you guys don't agree on stuff? I don't, that's a good question. I don't know. I think we tend to agree on stuff where it's like, if he's that passionate about something, I can usually hear it, you know, or if I'm, that passionate about it he can definitely hear it from me so um i think we're pretty good like that's the thing about having a good writing partner i think you guys just generally see that more or less the same you know if there is a moment where you guys really disagree on something you're gonna hash it out until you do agree on it it's almost like there's no option but mm -hmm. to find a solution so it's never really a problem with uh with us but i'm sure I'm sure there's other writers that I could work with and will work with. Well, for instance, like on Paranormal, you know, that's not, I'm a director for hire on that. And that was being written by Chris, Chris Landon. He was terrific, very funny writer, really sweet guy. You know, he's, he's that, those are his babies. Like he's written all the Paranormals basically since the first one of it, or not the first one, but onwards. Mm -hmm. So in that case, it's really on me. I'm not writing that. Obviously, I'm just directing, but I'm, you know, there's a lot of like kind of like writing out scenes with each other or figuring things out. But at the end of the day, I know these this is his world that he's created. So essentially, I I have to get on board with his ideas. And then if I disagree with it, I need to understand his vision. You know, I have to understand what he's talking about until I force myself to agree with it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, that is, that is interesting. And, and it's, um, you know, it's, I, I, as a writer, I haven't found most directors that I've worked with and they're the director and I'm just the writer. Um, they're nearly as um, amenable as that, or they see it quite like that. Um, that's refreshing to hear as a director, but I guess you're also a writer. So that gives you a little bit of a different perspective. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Chris is also just such a, you know, really like paranormal is his, his create, you know, he's really created all those other ones. So it's mm -hmm. like, is who am I to tell him really what it is? And I, obviously I've got, yeah, I'll just really under, there were only a few times where I was like, wait, I really got to figure this out. I have to yeah. understand what he's going for. And then I need to get on board so that I can give it that life. Um but, what does your what does your development process look like? So once you um and David had a draft of Land of Bad that you like, um, what were those next steps? Do you have some actor friends? Do you have some producer friends? Do you have some other writer friends that you send it to? You get notes. Maybe you can just discuss that. What does your development process look yeah, like? Yeah, I mean, this one was crazy. That we we had it sort of set up with these these folks, and then that sort of fell apart, and then somebody like ended up. It, there was so much time. I remember one of the initial guys I, who was involved, like he ended up like passing away and that was crazy. Mm -hmm. There's so much time between this movie mm -hmm. being written and being made. Um, you know, we, at one point, the movie was actually possibly going to be uh, with Gerard Butler and, um, oh shoot, I forgot his name. It, he directed one of the, you know, London is fallen movies. Oh, I can't remember his name. Really nice guy. Um, but he ended up starting, he started to go to work on the plane. And then I don't even know if he ended up directing that. I think somebody else ended up directing that. But mm. so it's funny, like I wasn't, because I was kind of busy with other things. I For a while, I was not going to direct it. I was just going to uh, produce um, alongside. And then in the end, um, 
you know, I there just sort of was a sudden window. And uh, we, you know, I had met Russell Crowe through some other stuff and um, would just sent him the script. I was, hey, would you ever be interested in doing this? And he said, like, well, I'm pretty busy right now, but it's good to be wanted. And um, I, uh, I'll i take a look and, you know, I'll, I'll let you know in a few weeks. And he called me the next day and he was like, hey, actually, I really like this. Um, if you can pull it together, uh, I'm in. And then that really sets everything off because once yeah. you have, uh, I was very fortunate to get him on early and now it's like buyers and, you know, this was a foreign sales movie, which isn't always the easiest way to make a movie. Um, but in this case, it, it worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can just describe that, that foreign sales movie to our audience, what that actually means. I mean, certainly yeah. a guy like Russell Crowe has international appeal. So that's yeah. a big piece of it. Yeah, it's just, it's how you pull the financing together, which obviously in the independent space is the most important part. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they pre-sell the movie. They pre-sell the movie to all these territories based off of the script and the talent on board, in this case, Russell. And, um, you know, they're able to, like, from that money, you're able to, you basically make the movie with that money that you've pre-sold the movie. So it's sort of a, it's a little bit of a backwards way to do it because you lock yourself into an exact budget, which is not bad, but mm -hmm. you're, you're doing that. Um, often foreign sales movies tend to be very above the line heavy where they're paying all the players, like all the names, all the actors, producers, directors, they're all getting like fat paychecks. And then they tend to just be like, oh, whatever, we'll make the movie with this much money. Yeah. <laughs> so you're you're above the line is inflated and you're below the line is like almost non-existent. And that that's a terrible way to make a movie. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, me knowing that I'm like, OK, guys, we cannot do that because that will you know, you just don't get anything out of that often. So, um, you know, you just have to kind of. For me, coming from the independent world as a younger cinematographer, I'd seen movies made that way, and I knew though they never produce good movies, you know. Um, so yeah, just knowing that you kind of want to set up the film in a way that won't won't do that, you know. Mm -hmm. Carefully watching the budget, carefully you know knowing what certain things would cost, and and, and I'm, uh, I'm how curious to set aside money. Yeah. And I'm curious. Um, my next question is, how do you handle genre requirements? And especially something like this, as you said, you're you're doing these foreign sales. This is sort of a genre movie. There's going to be, as you say, it, it's I think what you're getting is these films tend to be formulaic because they're pre-selling them and they need to have all of these things in place for those people to give money before the film's made. So like you hear about action movies or horror movies, you got to have an action scene every 10 pages. You got to have a scare, you know, for yeah. a comedy. You got just how do you handle some of those sort well, of rigid requirements? Requirements for something like this yeah i i mean nobody i think our script already had that action so i wasn't too worried about that it's more and that is true those are those are you know important to know that you do need those things in the foreign sales world usually but if they're written well it's okay you know it's like as long as they're written well and they're exciting and they're cool and they're still character centric that is fine it's more the management of money in my opinion that is the big problem in the foreign sales thing because if you steal too much, you've literally, you know, robbed Peter to pay Paul. And now there's nothing left to pay all the people that make the sound design great, the editing great, the, you know, the coloring, the, the, the VFX. Like if you have spent all the money already, then you have nothing to make the movie with. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, on Land of Bad, we were, you know, it was very difficult. Like we had a lot of crazy things where we were, really you know watching how we're spending the cash so that we could pay some of these professionals that i've worked with in the past that are so talented like just just our sound mixing and sound design for instance came from wayne limar's like he's you know wes anderson's guy and he's just amazing he's so talented he's He's never happy with his work. Just like, I feel like I'm never happy with my work. And normally on like a foreign sales movie, you would never get, you know, you couldn't get him. He's either too expensive or maybe he's not interested in doing that film. And just watching a film with bad sound is one of the worst experiences you can have. So, you know, from a screenwriting perspective, writing the characters, writing the story in a way that 
you can get other good professionals to want to work with you is is so important mm-hmm. you know yeah yeah for sure so i wonder if we can dig into um your relationship with russell crow a little bit i get a lot of emails from people um you know they've got their script and they email me and say oh this actor would be perfect for this role in my movie how do i contact them and you know the reality is and maybe you can speak to this a little bit the reality is even if an actor likes a script i mean his agent still might require the producers to sign a pay per play deal which means you're going to have to raise some funds funding before you get that in line, but maybe you can speak to that a little bit. What exactly did Russell Crowe give you? What was your prior relationship? Let's talk about that. You said you had met him on a few other projects doing stuff, and maybe you can just talk about what was your prior relationship like with him so that you could pass him the script. And then ultimately, what did that look like in terms of getting him on board? Honestly, yeah. So I'd written this other movie called World Breaker, which is a fantasy movie about a an old warlord, sort of like a Scottish unforgiven, where this uh, old warlord is like has to kind of return to his roots to save his family. Um, and he had read that and, and really liked it. He was in town um, to impress for the movie, the nice guys. And yeah, we had connected and I brought all this art to his hotel where he was staying. And I set it all up in this other room. He came in, we had a coffee together and I took him through all the art and all my, my vision for the film. And he was like, Hey, this is really cool. Um, so he he came on board to do that. Unfortunately, things happened and, and that movie didn't go, but we had stayed in touch. So I was very, very lucky in this case to have, you know, his phone number essentially and just texted him like, hey, I'd love to send this to you. And then at the same time, we'd made a real offer. I don't know if it was like pay or play. I probably was not pay or play, but so it was sort of a double pronged um, approach where, yeah, we make a real offer. So there's real you know, we had sent, you know, this is a real thing, but then I sent the script to him personally and was very Mm -hmm. lucky to like have that personal relationship with him. Um, And you're saying a real offer, meaning the normal channels, your casting director reached out to his agent and then yeah, producers really producers uh, or I guess it could be a cat. In this case, it was just the producers, you know, talk to his agent. Here's the offer, Mm -hmm. um, you know, sent it formally and yeah, then so working uh, the front end, the back the same end, time. Yeah. yeah. I, the agent, of course, at that time does not know that I have contacted Russell personally. <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and then Russell's like, Hey, if you guys can pull this together, he didn't even know there was a real offer. I just said at that point, I'm like, Oh, awesome. Well, mm-hmm. um, yeah, there's a real offer. Just if you're interested, you know, and he's like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, yeah, I'll talk to my, my people about it. So it was kind of the, the perfect way for that to happen. But you know, also, yeah, Russell's not like, who's this random guy hitting me up? You know, mm-hmm. it's very fortunate that we'd had a previous relationship. And um, I definitely think another thing people maybe that, I mean, obviously the financing becomes easier with an Academy Award winning actor that's, you know, been the lead in studio films. Um, but um, how much does that how much does that play in at this level after many, many years um, in terms of just getting your fund, your funding in place um, and not just funding, but also actors. Um, I know I, I've talked to a lot of producers, you know, sometimes they'll overpay for that first name actor because once you have that first name actor, other actors name actors sort of look at it as a more legitimate project. Um, so yeah. once you had Russell Crowe on board, just talk about that a little bit. How, how easy was it then to cast the rest of the film and how easy was it to actually raise some of that money? Yeah, pretty pretty easy at that point because yeah, he does have the, you know, everyone knows Russell Crowe and I I'm pretty sure they they then went I think they sold it at can to the foreign sales in the film market to the foreign sales buyers and um but even before then I think we got Liam Hemsworth to play the main role of Kenny and um you know, we just made that offer directly to his agent and um yeah ended up speaking with them and he was on board obviously he knows russell so he loves that Mm -hmm. so everything feels better at that point because you you know you're not um just going out like okay who's gonna star in this reaper role Mm -hmm. so it does really really help of course um having that initial um cornerstone to your project yeah um yeah and then yeah they were able to i think sell it pretty well Mm -hmm. Uh, but they all kind of know like there's so many like i hate to say it but those companies have like formulas for how much we kind of know what the budget's going to be approximately give or take a little bit 
once you get mm-hmm. certain people on board because they know what they're selling these this package for to the foreign sales. Anyways, foreign sales world is a crazy one and it's very easy to make a terrible mm-hmm. movie that way, but it's also you can make great movies that way. Mm-hmm. You just have to be cognizant of the um yeah, not not like putting too much money above the line and then not having anything to make the movie with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So just changing directions a little bit here, just maybe you can give our, our audience, um, mostly screenwriters, what advice do you have for folks? They come up to you, they're trying to break into the business. Maybe they've written a few scripts. Um, what is your advice in the year 2024 um, for just breaking into the business and getting your career going? I mean, I think the most important thing begins with, this is why I think it's, you know, there's so many books on screenwriting. There's so many books about how to assemble the watch, if you will. Like making a movie is you got to jam all the things in there and they all got to fit and flow together. That's hard, obviously. I think it's so important to like, and I know this from being a director. It's like sometimes you'll have these scenes where you're like, really, this scene only exists to get me from here to here. And I really like this scene. This scene's going to be so fun to shoot. And that scene over there is, oh, man, I can't wait to do that. But then I have this other scene where I'm like, oh, man, I wish I could just go back a year or two from before and rewrite this and make something that I really wanted to shoot here. Mm -hmm. And I think the most important thing is like every scene you want to, you should only let yourself have like maybe five of those stupid scenes that have to be in there to connect something. And all the other ones, the whole shebang should all be scenes that you like love that you like, Oh, this is so cool. This is so fun. Or I can't, I love what he says here. And oh, I love how he does this or he, you know, decides to do that. Like, I can't wait to see that come to life. I cannot wait. I cannot wait. Mm-hmm. And if you can't wait to see it, trust me, other people are going to feel the same way. And that's how you make a good movie. It has to be ah! that you can't wait to do, can't wait to break the life. Can't wait to see Russell Crowe do that. I cannot wait, you know? I couldn't wait for Russell Crowe to turn to those guys and say, eat a bag of dicks, you know? <laughs> like, I can't wait for that. I can't yeah. wait to see how he does that. And that's so, or complaining about his chair, you know, like, I, you want to write stuff you want to see. And it's so easy in today's screenwriting world to like, and I'm not saying those to get caught, like trying to make the plot be good or the, you know, trying to make the watch fit and all that. If you truly just write scenes that you want to watch, like actual moments, and you really are like, whoa, that's cool. Like it's hard. But if you can really make shit little, just think of it. Don't think of it as the whole movie. Just think every day. Do you want to watch what you're writing? Mm -hmm. Why is it cool? Like what's special about it? What makes you want to watch this? And if you write enough of those scenes and they all go together, trust me, you're going to make a cool movie. Mm -hmm. Like you just will. Yeah. But where you get caught up is just like, oh, wait, the movie has to go together like this. And the hero has to do that. And yes. And that's how you make a terrible movie. Because mm-hmm. you're just caught in the the like walls of like shit that's sort of like how the plot's supposed to work. And that's terrible. Yeah. You just want to write cool stuff. Mm-hmm. And I swear to God, even if you don't, even if you just write cool stuff and you you like make that version of that, like, and it was like a weird story and it didn't really work from a story perspective, it I guarantee you, you would still have a lot of people who are like, Man, that movie was weird, but I I really liked it, you know? Because mm-hmm. at the end of the day, you still got to shoot it and you still want to love what you're shooting. Mm-hmm. So yeah. write the things that you want to watch. Sound then, advice, sound advice. You now, won't I'm, go wrong. It's that easy. Mm-hmm. I swear to God. And maybe I'm, you won't make the perfect Save the Cat movie or maybe mm-hmm. you won't make the whatever. But I swear to God, that's what Tarantino does. Tarantino just giggled. I swear to God, he's sitting there at his thing and he's laughing mm-hmm. he's like oh my god i can't wait for him to blow that guy's head off in the back and now they gotta clean up this mess let's mm-hmm. make it about that like they gotta just clean up this mess in the back of his car that's gonna be so funny i can't wait oh he's gonna say this he's gonna say that mm-hmm. oh, you know he's laughing enjoying his ah! so much that if you don't feel that passion about what you're doing start over pick a new story and start finding something that makes you laugh mm-hmm. and enjoy what you're writing 
Yeah, yeah. And I just speaking to that, and maybe you can speak on this a little bit. When Gunner described this process with love, like the thing I came away from was I just was like, wow, this guy sounds like a really passionate filmmaker. And that's just the way. And you, as you describe it, standing out there, you know, keeping the rain off, it's just that passion for getting it done. And I just, I always tell people, you know, we all have these tools. Um, and I, you know, how many people in the world built a space set in their parents' back? yard who are not actually you know writing and directing feature films i would say most of them probably are if you have that much passion um and maybe you can speak to that a little bit just where do you get this passion from how do you get out of bed every morning still feeling the same passion <laughs> for all of these these projects yeah. that you originally did no thank you i mean look definitely the younger version of me had a crazy like i hate to say it, the business is very very tough and it's very easy to get tired and get beat down. Like in the now having spent years in it, obviously. I loved here's the thing. And I learned this on um I was we were so fortunate back then. Like love, like I had a ton of enthusiasm. You have that youthful energy that is just it's somehow in you. I don't know if it's you're just your body works better or whatever, but you just have tons of energy. Very little negativity has entered because you haven't been through the ringer in the business yet. You don't know how the studios work or all that works. So you just have pie in the sky. Let's make cool shit. And you're dreaming shots that can't even be done, but the, the mm -hmm. dreams are alive. The problem is, and I learned this on underwater because I went back to music school at night. I, underwater, I went to this music school in LA. Um, the whole post, like all posts, I was doing posts and I go to this night school to learn how to make music. And it was like producing music stuff. Um, and that was an eye-opening experience because I was in this class with all these kids who were like out of high school. And then I saw like every day, everyone's talking about other people and like other, you know, DJ people or producers and they're all, everyone's on social media and it's all like, kind of like what they're doing and how I, I should make my thing sound like this, or I should do that if I want to be like that, or he's successful doing this. So I should do that. And I was like, Oh my God, like these kids don't get it. Like, you, I was so lucky. I didn't have any of that social media because we didn't have it back then. So I was just like, whatever, I'll make a spaceship. This will be mm -hmm. great. It's going to be so cool. Whereas like if I'd had social media, I probably would be like, well, nobody else is doing that. Or that's a terrible idea. You're just constantly thinking about other people rather than just thinking about your actual ideas. So I think it's super important to just separate your your headspace now with all the noise and what should be done and what's what's right or what's wrong and truly seek out things that you love watch movies that you love go oh god i want to make a story kind of like that i just want to do this or do that and then turn off all the noise turn off all the social mm -hmm. media don't compare yourself because that's how i think i had that energy i i, I had nobody to compare myself to because i'm in the middle of nowhere on a ranch building mm -hmm. a space station like mm -hmm pretty lonely at, at, unless mm -hmm. Gunner came up to see what I was doing, you know, or maybe a contractor comes over to help me figure out a compound miter angle. Mm -hmm. Like it was like, you know, it just had passion because there's nothing else to do, you know? Mm -hmm. And yeah, then I was yeah. writing at the time. I, I didn't have final drafts. So I was writing like paragraphs of what would happen, you know? And I had, like I said, I had that stack of scenes mm -hmm. and inevitably yeah. while you're doing that, if you know anything about movies, you're going to have that, I didn't know about structure, but I know near somewhere in the second act, he's going to have his lowest moment where all is lost. Like mm -hmm. you just know you're going to have that, you know? And so you write that part in and, you know, anyways, it's, it, it works if you're just passionate about yeah. the bits that you're doing. Sound advice for sure. So I just like to wrap up these interviews by asking my guests, if there's anything you're watching currently that you can recommend to our mostly screenwriting audience, anything on Netflix, HBO, Hulu, anything you think is good. Yeah, I'm watching the curse. My wife and I are deep in that. I watched and where two, is that playing? I watched the show Gold Rush because I like watching the big machines move around. Mm -hmm. That's reality TV. <laughs> and I'm watching The Curse. And that's on Paramount Plus or like Showtime or something okay. like that. And um, man, what a crazy show. That is just wild. Huh. Like it's written by, I think, Nathan Fielder and Benny Safty or something. Hmm. And it's just wow i don't even know what we're watching it's so different and interesting huh. the characters are just so real and crazy i it's just crazy. okay yeah that's a great recommendation i haven't watched that yet so i'll put that very on my strange list. but very 
Man, it's amazing work. It's just amazing work. So how can people see The Land of Bad? What is the release schedule going to be like for that? February 16th in theaters. Uh, okay. be in, you know, it's a traditional release. So be in theaters for a little bit. And um, yeah, hopefully, you know, people can catch it on the big screen because the sound design and everything, the music, Brandon Roberts did such an amazing job. And yeah, it's just, uh, it's a pretty cool theatrical experience, I think. Okay, perfect, perfect. Yeah, hopefully people can catch it in a theater. What's the best way for people to keep up with what you're doing? Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, a blog? Anything yeah, I'm just comfortable sharing? super, my name's Super Swift on Twitter or Instagram, just okay. one word, Super Swift. Okay. <laughs> Perfect, perfect. I'll grab that and put that in the show notes so people can awesome. click over to that. Um, so, well, I really appreciate um, William coming on and talking with me today. Good luck with this film and good luck with all your future films as well. Awesome. Thank awesome. you. Really appreciate meeting you. It was great. Hey, yeah, thank you. We'll talk to you later. Awesome. Bye. A quick plug for the SYS Screenwriting Analysis Service. It's a really economical way to get a high quality professional evaluation on your screenplay. When you buy our three pack, you get evaluations at just $67 per script for feature films and just $55 for teleplays. All the readers have professional experience reading for studios, production companies, contests, and agencies. You can read a short bio on each reader on our website, and you can pick the reader who you think is the best fit for your script. Turnaround time is usually just a few days, but rarely more than a week. The readers will evaluate your script on six key factors, concept, character, structure, marketability, tone, and overall craft, which includes formatting, spelling, and grammar. Every script will get a grade of pass, consider, or recommend, which should help you roughly understand where your script might rank if you were to submit it to a production company or agency. We can provide an analysis on features or television scripts. We also do proofreading without any analysis. We will also look at a treatment or outline and give you the same analysis on it. So if you're looking to vet some of your project ideas, this is a great way to do it. We will also write your logline and synopsis for you. You can add this logline and synopsis writing service to an analysis, or you can simply purchase this service as a standalone product. As a bonus, if your screenplay gets a recommend or a consider from one of our readers, you get to list the screenplay in the SYS Select database, which is a database for producers to find screenplays and a big part of our SYS Select program. Producers are in the database searching for material on a daily basis. So it's another great way to get your material in front of them. As a further bonus, if your script gets a recommend from one of our readers, your screenplay will get included in our monthly best of newsletter. Each month we send out a newsletter that highlights the best screenplays that have come through our script analysis service. This is monthly newsletter that goes out to our list of over 400 producers who are actively looking for material. So again, this is another great way to get your material out there. So if you want a professional evaluation of your screenplay at a very reasonable price, check out www.sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. Again, that's sellingyourscreenplay.com slash consultants. So this is the part of the show where I tell you who is on the next episode. And now that I'm doing the episodes only once a month, I honestly have no idea who's coming on next month. I have not actually done the interview. When I was doing them every week, um, I would obviously have the interview. Typically, it would be recorded before um, I would even record the, the one that I was putting together that week. So I would have a, a good number of backlogs on this. Um, so I'm trying to mix it up a little bit and um, we'll just see, but um, I'm going to be working on getting a good interview for next week. So definitely, or next month rather. So definitely check that out. Anyways, that's the show. Thank you for listening.